All right, we're going to invite two more people onto our panel now for our second part. First is Vanessa Carey. She's the founder and CEO of Seed Global Health, and she is herself a doctor also. And Kara Page, who's executive director of the Audre Lorde Project, um, and a self-described black, queer, feminist, cultural worker and organizer. So thank you both so much. Um, Vanessa, I want to start out with you because your um, program is, you know, you're giving us a sort of vital international perspective on this panel. You work in some of the countries that are most affected by HIV AIDS, and your, your program is fascinating because it's essentially getting doctors and nurses, health workers, to sort of partner with the Peace Corps and go out there and train local health workers to provide high levels of service. So give us an example. I've, I've read about some of the things that in the very first day, one of your health workers was able to save lives. Tell us, tell us how this can be, how it works and how it can be applied elsewhere. Uh, well, certainly. First of all, thank you for letting me join you all. And I, um, what our organization does is we're trying to solve the problem that there fundamentally are not enough doctors, nurses, and midwives in the world to care for the world's population. And in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's 75% of the global burden of HIV, there's only 3% of the world's healthcare workforce to try to address that burden and only 1% of the world's healthcare expenditure. You're talking about countries where there is one doctor for every 100,000 people versus in America where there is one doctor for every 440 people. I'm not saying we don't have huge problems here, but there are massive problems, certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in many ways this is our problem. The world is much smaller. We have a lot of um, immigration now that is happening. Much of this country's growth is gonna be through immigration, and at the end of the day, we have to realize that there we are a global community, and we fundamentally have to be tackling these problems. And SEED is the only organization, SEED Global Health is the only organization uh, that is doing this really in the world. And I'm very proud to be a partner of PEPFARS, so it's delightful to be able to share a room um, with Ambassador Burks, who's been a tremendous supporter and I think understands that you need functional healthy health systems, much like you need that in New York City. Um, that's been a big problem in these countries and that's the problem that we're trying to solve. We have done this in partnership with the Peace Corps with the idea that we can take advantage of their economy of scale to send Americans abroad in a culturally sensitive, integrated way, but to spend a year of their life integrated into the community, living like their counterparts. They live on $5,000 a year in order to be able to really be a part of their community. We tell them to go to funerals. We tell them to go to weddings. We tell them to understand where they're living because that allows them to understand what it means for their community to be affected by diseases like HIV. In the hospitals where our volunteers work and their counterparts most importantly, 80% of the population is HIV positive for on the wards that we are working on. So you basically assume that everybody is suffering from HIV in some capacity. And as you know now, HIV isn't you know, just about infection, it's about heart failure, it's about diabetes now, it's about many other problems that we can try to help take care of. And I think the story that you're referring to is that one of our volunteers who was an OBGYN um, arrived at her site and within uh, several hours of being at her site, she was called by her counterparts to come immediately to the operating room. And she got there and she realized it was far too late to save this pregnant woman's life. And it turned out it was too late to save the twins that that woman was carrying. So within six hours of being a new volunteer in this program, she had lost three patients. So the next day, she got called again to the emergency operating room uh, urgently, and this time she realized that she could save the mother's life, that there was a very correctable problem from a woman who'd been laboring in her village for three days, and that she could save this woman's life. And that means that that woman would now go home to her five children, and that those five children were more likely to be, have a chance at an education, to be socio and economically advantaged throughout their lifetime. And so those five children's lives, in some ways, were saved. But what she also did, Maureen, was she taught her counterparts how to deal with this problem when it happens again. And Tanzania is a country where one woman dies every hour from a complication of pregnancy or childbirth. So Maureen single-handedly now throughout the year was able to repeat the, you know, how to do this procedure so that everybody could learn she could start saving lives. One other example was a colleague of mine or one of our volunteers who arrived and she saw, she walked on the ward her first day and there were three dead babies. And she just sort of said, I'm just gonna look, listen, learn, and try to understand why these, these children have died. 
she quickly realized nobody knew how to recognize when a baby couldn't breathe, and when they did recognize it, they didn't know what to do about it. So she spent the next month doing trainings till it came to the point where she'd come in in the morning and no babies were dead. And her students were coming after her and saying, guess what, ma'am, we did this, and we recognized this baby had this problem, and we did this and this and this, and now they're fine. And the students and the volunteers and her counterparts got so excited they could suddenly save lives with this knowledge that they organized their own trainings. And they trained 200 local Tanzanian doctors, nurses, and midwives on their own as Tanzanians. And then that was so successful, they've gotten their own funding and are now taking this training around the country, Tanzanian-led to you know, Tanzanian-taught. And that's the kind of change that we're trying to make. And so we're, you know, day by day, patient by patient, we're trying to make a difference. What I love about that story is the multiplier effect and the fact that it's also grassroots. And this second part of the panel is actually called Power to the People. And we're supposed to be talking about what can be done on a grassroots <laughs> level to address some of these problems. And Kara Page, I want to turn to you because you talk about how you're more, you don't want to just advocate for people for medical treatment for HIV affected individuals, you also want to do healing. What do you mean by that? Healing for cities. So again, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. Um, certainly, the Audre Lord Project is an organizing center. It's in our, in our 20th year. And much of the work that we've done around economic and racial justice for lesbian, gay, bi, trans, two-spirit, gender non-conforming people of color is even to exist as an organizing center that opened when at the beginning of the on onset of AIDS and HIV, we redefined how communities of color in New York City in particular as LGBT, STG, and C people of color can exist um, outside of the, the uh, pathology of only being seen as uh, being associated to HIV and AIDS. And inside of that, we really looked at understanding the impact of generational trauma and what it means to heal and transform not only from HIV AIDS, uh, but really from white supremacy, uh, racial injustice, poverty, homelessness, and how those social determinants highly impact our condition, our livelihood, and our dignity. All right. Mindy, I want to come back to you and ask you, you know, you have so succinctly di diagnosed for us the problem of what cities have done wrong for these last several decades that have helped create problems and spread problems. So if you're the doctor for the city, um, not in a medical sense, but in a larger therapeutic sense, tell us what's the cure, what's the prescription, what can cities be doing better, and how? Um, we uh, have three suggestions. The, the first is that we think it's essential for cities and everybody to acknowledge and fight racism, because that drives this engine of displacement. The second is that we think um, there's always a lot of despair when you go into poor, especially poor communities and cities. And we think that it's important to know that there's never nothing there. And then the third is really that everything we need is already here, which is an ecological perspective, that when we go into communities, we have to honor and respect and lift up what people have and what exists, and then knit the parts back together with that, that, from that perspective of, of just honoring what we have. With the cities that you've worked with, New York City in particular, but you know, you've also s spoken and worked and done research all over, <coughs> what kind of success have you had in having city governments acknowledge, yeah, there's institutional racism, this is a big problem, and we're ready to deal with it? Who actually admits that? I would say nobody. Right. <laughs> but That's I'm what having, I'm trying to get you to say. So. I haven't given up. <laughs> You, okay, well, it's, it's good you haven't given up, but if you haven't gotten people to admit it yet, how do you get to steps two and three if people won't even deal with step one? Well, I'm working from the ground up. <laughs> so sort of starting with step three, then back to two, and then no, no, eventually no, because, getting governments to acknowledge because, it? Because um, community, communities can face this reality. And so if we can get people from, what, what we especially love is to get people from different parts of a city to come together and walk their city together. And once they walk their city together and they begin to see the big picture, they know they have to do something. And then this work takes momentum. So, so that's how I believe we have to start. I think governments are going to be the last to, to get on the bandwagon. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have had success, for example, in reconnecting the so-called giraffe path and getting the city to sort of one of these broken arteries where the bridge was shut down, getting them to reconnect it. And so there's now this wonderful path that goes from Central Park all the way to Cloisters, I believe. Yes. Is there, does that in any way somehow help the larger problems that we're talking about? Does it somehow help the underlying 
environment in which we live that can you know, either bring down the incidence or help the treatment of HIV AIDS? How does it fit into the bigger picture having a nice path to walk that connects the city? Well, it's an extraordinary transformation in a series of parks that, that go between Central Park and the Cloister, so a, a series of parks along a cliffside that had all been abandoned and were, had become very threatening to the neighborhoods around them. So they, those parks have now been reintegrated back into the neighborhoods. So they're and no longer places for needle users and drug addicts and play, is Well, that we like to think of it as harm reduction. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, all kinds of stuff that goes on in parks. Um, but it, we think it shouldn't be the only thing that goes on in parks. So there's, there's more of a balance. And, and now that there's, the, you know, the parks have become an asset for the community mm -hmm. so people can ride their bicycles and walk their dogs. Um, I was there on Saturday for our annual Hike the Heights and it was extraordinary how many people were using High Bridge Park and going over the High Bridge which reopened this past year. So these are extraordinary changes in the life of a neighborhood. But the problem is that um, we are in this massive inversion, this massive gentrification. So the neighborhoods we've been working in, Harlem and Washington Heights and Inwood, are under great threat that the people of color will be displaced. So we, we have to have this larger ecological perspective so that we can stabilize populations. I, I'm a social psychiatrist, and stabilizing populations is, is the name of the game. All right, Dimitri, take us back to the specific issue of HIV AIDS and people knowing and understanding their risk and their status. Your work, I believe, shows that 93% of people in New York City know their HIV status. Why is it not 100%? Yeah, Why, I mean, what are you doing wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. I think that one of the things um, that we need to do better is really leverage all of the resources that we have. I mean, so I, I, I'm sort of looking out at the audience and I'm seeing Donna Futterman over there, who is a leader in Bronx Nose, and I, I look at the Bronx Nose story and see that we've got a Brooklyn Nose and a Staten Island Nose and a Manhattan Nose, and, and what we've learned is that by creating community energy and, and not just necessarily adding resources, but sort of leveraging resources and bringing people together, what happens is the Bronx is probably the best tested jurisdiction in the world. Mm. Bang. And so I, I think that, the, that really the answer is that, that sort of realizing what all the resources are and being really, really honest about what the barriers are. So I think, you know, I'm really proud to say that in New York City, um, we've really taken a very specific stance on really what racism is in the city. Our, our department of, uh, our, our health department head, Dr. Bassett, has been creating this energy behind the sort of Black Lives Matter movement and how it interacts with health. And what she's doing is she's really bringing it back to the neighborhood and taking spaces that were dilapidated, spaces that really weren't being used, and creating really action centers where health can flourish. And so I think that rather than sort of looking at the neighborhoods and saying, you know, I give up, we're never going to get them to learn their HIV status, I close my eyes and I see our community health survey and look at the Bronx as the, the, the piece of the city with the brightest, brightest amount of knowledge of HIV status to the point where newly diagnosed people in the Bronx, when they get diagnosed, their CD4 count is over 350. And by the way, another really important piece of this from the perspective of the right answer is that we cannot look at people who are diagnosed with with HIV and say, I'm really sorry that happened. We have to say, congratulations for getting diagnosed. Welcome to our services. This is not something that's a bad thing. It's something that's a good thing. So just like we're looking at HIV negative people as an opportunity to prevent HIV, we look at people diagnosed with HIV and say, you're not going to get sick. And that's the only way to make that test lose the stigma. It's to say, listen to the community, put it in the neighborhood, learn from the people on the ground what to do, learn from the street what to do, and then just walk the walk and talk the talk. You cannot say, I'm sorry you have HIV. You have to say, congratulations, you have a diagnosis and you're going to be fine. Bottom line. Well, you're the first person on our panel to use this very key word here, stigma. And I think we need to pick that up and carry it on. Now, Brad, your work is about that stigma. And, you know, we know that HIV disproportionately, you know, I don't think too many people think, oh, yay, congratulations. Not too many people want to get a positive diagnosis. But as he, as, you know, Dimitri says, there's a way to make it positive to say these services are available. Your work shows that marginalized groups, minorities, women, are disproportionately affected, number one, people who lack education, sex workers, 
I want to know what specifically, what legal methods or structures have, through your research, you found that can help this problem, both, both the decriminalization and, I, and I'm thinking of something else, that in some of the Obamacare programs in the states, I think it was, was it Florida, where they actually tried to put in a couple of the plans, make all the HIV drugs in the highest category. They were essentially saying, we don't want anyone with HIV or AIDS in our health care program, and that's something that you have to fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I it, look, I think New York, I think San Francisco, other cities are great examples of, this, of setting goals and giving people hope that they can access care and they can ask, access uh, medications that will prevent them uh, from being infected. But I, what I really want to talk about is the importance of community, and particularly community of people who are HIV positive, the importance of inclusion um, uh, of everyone uh, who's HIV positive, and looking at all sorts of uh, different forces, sources of discrimination and stigma and hope. Uh, and I'll start with hope. Uh, I've been HIV positive uh, for over two decades. I am so grateful that I'm alive today. I was diagnosed with AIDS actually uh, 20 years ago uh, this spring, uh, and given about six to 18 months to live. I did not dream <laughs> of a life of viral suppression. I dreamed of a cure. And if you want to get people with HIV engaged, we have to give them more to hope for, more to dream about, which means that one day they will live a life um, uh, of not having HIV. So there has to be hope. There has to be community. I'm from a town of 90 people. Uh, uh, my mother was probably embarrassed that she's watching this. Uh, 90 people called Grain Valley, Missouri. Uh, that's where I grew up. I rolled in uh, to LA in a white pickup in 1995 uh, with huge lymph nodes uh, hurting me on the back of my neck, knowing that I was uh, HIV positive. But when I got the test results, Two weeks later, I was devastated. I didn't know anyone in the city. But the woman who gave me the test, um, she gave me a hug, and she told me she was HIV positive. And that made, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that changed the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I was in a support group for people with HIV within an hour of rece receiving that test result. Um, and that changed, that's changed the rest of my life. They were part of a group called Being Alive Los Angeles. People a group of, by, and for people with HIV, and they taught me how to take care of myself, and they taught me to advocate for my rights, and that changed the rest of my life. And so cities really should foster community and visibility with people with HIV. And I'll just end with inclusion. If we actually had accurate data, I'm sure we'd find that transgender women of color are the group that most impacted by people, uh, most impacted by mm -hmm. HIV, that they have higher rates of proportion. These are, um, these are women, <laughs> these are people of color, these are people in the LGBT community. They face discrimination on all these bases and more than the sum of those bases. And unless uh, we include them in our efforts, we really can't tackle uh, this epidemic. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to host a citywide event called Unity in Los Angeles, which is really about not just an event for transgender people, but bringing the whole city together around uh, transgender people and that they are part of our city. Last year, uh, I couldn't get a single corporate sponsor to put their logo on that event. Couldn't get a city, <laughs> a, a city, a single uh, city official from Los Angeles uh, to put their name on it. A lot's changed in terms of gender <laughs> identity in the last year. Uh, Mayor Garcetti uh, is at the head of the host committee. Almost every wow. member of the city council is on it. And we're going to bring a lot of people together, not for an HIV an event, but for an event that shows part of the most vulnerable part of our city is included, is appreciated, is part of who we are. That's amazing, that amount of change in 12 months. Kara, I want you to pick up on what Brad is talking about and focus specifically on how do you sensitively reach out to these most marginalized groups. Now, Brad told us who he believes is the most marginalized group, right. um, transgender women of color. What's, what should cities be doing as a community activist? What's your perspective if you're advising mayors? What should they be doing to reach out? Yes, uh, let us lead. I mean, much to what you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, black trans women are uh, both uh, not getting the services, but also not pursuing them because there's still so much stigma in terms of gender identity and not being treated with respect, be that being misgendered or, or assumed M being called MSM. 
you know, we have a long way to go, so it's good to hear about this. Um, but certainly, you know, those of us that are most marginalized, uh, we should be in the center leading these programs, leading these uh, educational tools, leading the analysis and the critique. Uh, we know best uh, what we need. Black trans women know best what they need to survive or, or to thrive. And certainly, uh, in 2016, we have spent a long time, I think, uh, apologizing for uh, the LGB community or LGB movements leaving trans women behind. Mm -hmm. And for the Audre Lorde Project, we've always centered the leadership actually mm -hmm. of trans and gender nonconforming people of color. Um, I'm very concerned, as much as the parks are expanding in New York, I'm concerned about the massive incarceration still of queer and trans youth, and in particular, black and Latina trans women being scooped up in the park by police because of laws such as um, condoms as evidence that still do not value uh, the survival and livelihood of black trans women and queer youth. All right, Vanessa, everyone here on this panel has given us a lot to think about about the United <laughs> States and the challenges here. You're facing a pretty different landscape. I want you to lay that out for us, the international landscape and the developing world landscape. Um, you know, give us the contrast. First of all, how do you deal with this differently in rural communities versus in cities? And, um, you know, what are the primary challenges that you face? I think you've expanded your operations to Swaziland, which has the highest prevalence of HIV in the whole world. Tell us. Uh, yes, actually, we have the demand for our work has grown immensely. We've trained close to 10,000 doctors, nurses, and midwives in three years. Um, but that's not remotely enough, and we are going to Swaziland, highest HIV rate in the world, 30% of the population is HIV positive, and we're going to Liberia at the invitation of the president to help her rebuild after Ebola. And I think it's been interesting to hear the talk about community, because ultimately yeah. it's what we're talking about are systems, right? People, uh, systems, and everything coming together to align to take care of its population. And that's sort of the view that we take about health systems, that we need the health system to be strong enough to be able to care for a population across the range of health problems, but also to be advocates for what's happening in the world. I mean, at the end of the day, um, 70% of the world's HIV burden may exist in Sub-Saharan Africa, but that does not need to be the case. It's 2016. We do not need to live in a world where there are two standards of health care in the world, whether it is between here and Sub-Saharan Africa or whether it is in our own backyard in the community in New York or in San Francisco or wherever we are. And that's what we are all, I think, fundamentally united on in, in what we're trying to do. And so, you know, what's interesting is that we, a lot of people sort of say, well, how can you work, you know, internationally if there's all these problems in you know I hear at home and the truth is we're sending Americans to go spend a year of their life working in these settings and we know actually that Americans who do that are more likely to come home and work with underserved populations here in underserved specialties better understand the social determinants of health or at least be more sensitive to learning about them even if they are slightly different social determinants of health so we're actually investing in our own healthcare system as we're making this investment abroad which I think is critically important now, you sort of asked, I mean, how do you tackle these issues in rural versus city? And, I mean, it is very different. We work in 17 sites currently. We're going to 25 next year. Every country has a very different experience and a different culture. But even within that country, we have different experiences and different cultures that we need to take into account. And, you know, it's interesting because we work in Dar es Salaam, which is a growing urban center of, you know, that is in some ways very first world and in some ways very third world. I don't love that expression, but it creates a comparison. And then we work in areas that are in the middle of the country that have nothing, you know, ha barely any housing, barely any resources. And I think that um, the great challenge for us is that in many places we are battling a complete lack of drugs because you don't even have access. You get stockouts. You don't have the equipment you need. Our OBGYNs are counting gloves at the beginning of a week to figure out how many C-sections they can deliver and how many babies they're going to have to try to deliver breach. And then in that decision is who is HIV positive and who is mm -hmm. not because you want to ensure the safety of the mother and the baby when you're delivering. And so all of these things go into these complicated triage questions of what, um, how, to, how to, you know, make decisions. And I think that for us, what we're fundamentally, you know, it's, it, that's, it's sort of too broad of a question in some ways to be able to answer it because it is, it is so dependent on each area and place that, that we're working. Um, but I think what is fundamental to what we're trying to do, and I think it's a very shared cause here, is that we have to just decide that we're going to demand something different and we're going to be educated in how we're going to do it differently and that we're going to learn from our mistakes and that we're going to study what we do and that we're going to improve what we do with every year. 
But I think what is critically important is that we do rely on folks like you who want to spend your afternoon having this hard conversation in this room. And my request to all of you is that you take this conversation and you take it to your dinner tables and you take it to your coffee shop and you take it forth because we're only going to be able to see the difference in what we want if we are all going to collectively start to take on this challenge and ask these hard questions and decide that what's happening in the status quo is not acceptable. And we should celebrate the wins that we've had we should celebrate the victories and the things that we're doing and the fact that we can get people tested and that you've got a, you said 93% knows their status. I mean, that is amazing. But we still have to go for 100% and we do still have to hope. And I think that that demand, we should be demanding a cure. Because you know, we, we can stop this disease if we put our minds to it. And I think what's made me a little nervous, especially in the work that we do internationally, is that people are like, well, we got a lot of people on treatment. We feel good about that. No, we have a lot of people not on treatment. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people, and we don't have a cure yet, and we don't have a vaccine. And guess what? Bad news is we got a lot of work to do in HIV, but we've also got <clears throat> Zika. We've got all these other things. Mm -hmm. But just because we have these new things, we can't turn our mind away from what is already happening. We've made so much progress. And so that's the challenge that we face, is that people feel like it's acceptable because we've gotten some of these poor people in Africa on treatment. It's not everybody, so we're not done and we're not done in this country either. All right, good. Um, Vanessa has sort of answered my final question. I want to I wanna leave a, a couple minutes for, for your questions, but so very quick lightning round. The only one who doesn't have to answer is Vanessa because she just answered it. Mm -hmm. My last question is basically UNAIDS has this goal of ending the global epidemic by 2030 through the Fast Track Cities Initiative. It's encouraging municipal leaders to do their part in a big way. So quick top line, what's your advice or message for these leaders to tackle HIV in their cities? You're doing it yourself. What's your message to yourself and then each of the rest of you? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a broken record. You've got to do it with love. It's got to be about loving population. It's got to be about loving your city and about loving your neighborhoods. Okay, Mindy. Cities are under enormous stress from displacement all over the world and we've got to stabilize populations. Brad. We've got metrics for the treatment cascade about getting people onto treatment and virally suppressed. If we don't have metrics about ending discrimination and stigma, about making progress towards a cure, about improving quality of life, they won't, we won't pay attention, as much attention to that. We've got to create metrics and make those our goals. Kara. And we've got to ask, where are black trans women inside of all of this? Okay, well, that, I'm inspired. I don't know about you guys. I'm inspired. 